will come from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And God is good, because my brother, Worshipful Master Evans, he read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And he, he read verses 1 through 5. And this pericope of Scripture will come from John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. So, where one ends, another stands in to pick up. And then we'll also look at another brief section of scripture in Revelations chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of God in John chapter 1 reads, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which light every man that cometh into the world. And then as we turn over to Revelations chapter 1, and we look at verses 1 through 3, the word of God in Revelation says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. How many of you know that things are shortly coming to pass? Yeah. Amen. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he, he being John, saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Yes, you may be seated, brothers. Yes, God bless you for standing in the presence of the reading of the word of God. How many of you know that the time is at hand? Yes, if I were to hang a title on this message that God has given me today, it would be that... It's not about you. It's about who you know. It's not about you. It's about who you know. As the Word of God tells us, John the Baptist came to bear witness of a light. It wasn't the light of himself. It was the light of Jesus Christ. Am I right about it? Amen. And as we see in Revelation, John the Apostle, or John the Evangelist, was sent to bear record, not of himself, but to bear record of Jesus Christ, of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it was not about them, it was about who they knew. In regard to the recent and long-standing historical persecution and persistent disregard for the lives of people of color at the hands of police officers, at the hands of racist and hate-influenced and hate-inspired citizens, I want to stand before you this afternoon and say that as good as you look, as prosperous as we look right now, we ought to feel some level of discomfort in our spirit. We ought to be uncomfortable in our very soul because if you, yes you, resemble any one of those that has been killed before the right of due process or murdered while innocently minding your own business, I'm here to tell you right now that whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're male or whether you're female, yeah. that it can certainly happen to you. <clears throat> I must strongly disagree right here with our president mm -hmm. on the labeling of young black people protesting and even rioting as being thugs. Mm -hmm. I don't condone what they did, but I don't condemn it either. Right. I'm not walking in the same oppressive streets that they walk in. Mm -hmm. If youth in Baltimore are considered thugs, I ask you, who was Nat Turner? If we can't esteem one, then we can't esteem the other. We can't esteem one and then detest the other when oppression is the issue at hand. Talk back to me if you will. If people in Ferguson are thugs, then so was John Brown. If a young black man walking down the street, minding his own business, wearing a hoodie in Florida, is a thug, then so was Emmett Till. When he was dragged from his uncle's home in the middle of a Mississippi night, never to be seen alive again. 
You know the story. Yes, I'm here to protest that wearing a hoodie in Florida is no more deserving of a death sentence than a rumor of whistling at a white woman in rural Mississippi. Well, yeah. If black people that are rioting over centuries of injustice from New York to Chicago, from Detroit to Oklahoma, from Newark to Watts and Wilmington, North Carolina, and yes, right here in Winston-Salem, if they are thugs, I ask you, who are our revolutionaries? One man's rebel can be considered another man's revolutionary. The oppressor has no opinion in the matter. Because to him, those who cry out for a voice, those who cry out for consideration, those who cry out for equality, for justice, will always be discounted as the ungrateful, violent, and rebellious thug. As we gather here this afternoon, marking this auspicious occasion, as Master Masons and as Eastern Stars, men of morality and upright character, and women of grace and distinction, what say your heart to the truth of the matter? How do you process the circumstances that are evolving around you? How do you confront the storms that are raging on our horizons? When we consider the Freddie Grays and the Trayvon Martins, our cousins, the Walter Scotts, the prayers for the Sean Bells, and the Michael Browns, and the Akai Gurleys, when we consider the Eric Garners, and the Tamir Rices, and the Tamika Wilsons, and the Eleanor Bumpers, and the Ayanna Stanley Joneses, our cousins, our brothers, our sisters, our sons, our daughters, and the thousands of others that have been brutalized by police bullets and batons yeah. and dogs yeah. and by racism and by black on black violence yeah. down through the years. I ask you, what say your heart is to the obligation of the craft yeah. in which we should all be seeking to perfect, perfect ourselves? Yeah. What say your heart? When we consider the hate that we as people of color have had to endure of what we've been subjected to, what black man or black woman can silently agree to a senseless statement that racism is dead. We need only to look to the recent deaths of nine more innocent souls down in Charleston that have been added to the scrolls of those that have died as a result of so-called dead racism. My intent this afternoon on this St. John's Day is to issue a reminder to you that it's not always about you. Our struggle, our situation, it's bigger than any one of us. Amen. We need one another, and we need God to overcome Amen. the weary days ahead. Yeah. If we are waiting on governments and political solutions to the problems and the issues that we face as black Americans, then we are waiting in vain. We need first to repent of our sins. Yeah. We need to get down on our knees, yeah. and we need to start to pray. Mm -hmm. We need to pick up the word of God. And we need to stand on the word in faith yes. and ask that God's will be done in all things. Oh, yeah. Talk back to me if you will. Oh, yeah. We can march and we can shout all we want. But unless true change comes to a person's heart, all we're doing is wearing out shoe leather. I'm speaking of transformational change that only the conviction of the Holy Spirit can produce yes. in mankind. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about this afternoon? Yes. Our marching. And our shouting is in vain without true change from within. Yeah. Uh, we can change some policies, and we can change some practices, and we can change some presidential administrations, but we can't change other people. Yeah. We can't even change ourselves without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But through Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Yeah. And that is where my hope is built, yeah. and on nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. As we consider today the two Johns in these scriptures and who they were and what they stood for, I will briefly aspire as a preacher to examine the indelible mark that they left relative to biblical history and our faith as Christian men and women. John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. They understood that the only way to initiate the process of transforming people, of empowering people to turn away from sin and sinful lives, 
was through the leading of them to the light, life, and love, which indicates a personal relationship, yes. Minister Ramsey, with our Lord and Savior, yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. Isn't that what it's about? Isn't that what it's about? A personal relationship with Jesus. Yes. You got to know Jesus for yourself. Yes. These two St. John's, they realized that it was not about them. It was about who they knew. They knew the true light. Yeah. I'm talking about the light that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm not talking about the light that's controlled by the light switch. I'm talking about the light that should be residing inside of you. Yeah. I'm telling you right now this afternoon, in Providence Baptist Church, Kernersville, North Carolina, this 28th day of June, that the same light that shone bright for these two St. John's yeah. over 2,000 years ago, yeah. it still shines bright for you and I. Yeah. And you ought to be glad about it, that it still shines bright, and that we still have a chance to be in the light. I'm talking about the light of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The words of these revered men are still leading men and women to a relationship with Jesus Christ today. Yeah. While John the Baptist proclaims Christ and his coming, John the Evangelist reveals Christ and his second coming. Mm -hmm. uh, let me make this clear. Uh, the connectedness of these two men, uh, it precedes the coming of Jesus Christ into his full earthly ministry. Uh, scripture leads us to believe that John the Apostle, that is John the Evangelist, yes. was a disciple of John the Baptist. Yes. As he preached, baptized, and proclaimed Jesus Christ, uh -huh. and made straight the way of Jesus coming. Yes. Am I right about it? Yes. We see that John the Baptist was called to serve a purpose yes. that was not about him, yes. but it was a purpose that corresponded to who he knew. Yes. Like John. Yes, you and I, you and I, we are often called to a purpose. We are often called to serve on a committee. We are often called to lead an effort. We are sometimes called to chair a committee. We are called sometimes to prepare a program or even deputy to lead an organization. But unlike John, sometimes we make it all about us. We interject ourselves so deeply into what we are called to do that we detract from the purpose of why we've been called in the first place. Don't get quiet on me now. Just because a person is known for getting a job done, it doesn't always qualify them for doing a good job. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen it time and time again. Many people get the job done because they love to hear their name called on the program. But they drive away others that sincerely want to help. Many people get the job done because they have aspirations to a higher office. So in essence, uh, their effort is not about the good of the order. It's about themselves. But John, I'm talking about John right now, he realized and understood from the outset of his ministry that it was not about him. It was about who he was called to shed light upon. It was what he was called to do. It was not about John. Some preachers today that are called to preach the gospel Definitely don't get quiet on me now. I might be talking about your pastor. You don't have to say amen, but the truth is the truth. Some people that are called to preach the gospel today, they are infected and influenced with a celebrity or Amorite spirit. That's a mountainous spirit. It is a spirit that's bigger than any person. It's saying that I'm bigger than you and that you are a little person. That I outshine you. An Amorite spirit is a dangerous spirit in the church. You can read more on that on your own time. Yeah. But just remember to look up the Amorite spirit. It's a spirit that wants to overshadow everybody else's work. Uh, yes, they are. The preachers are skilled in their, in, in their elocution of the word. And they are, they are gifted and they are anointed in God's word and preaching the word. But they forget one thing. That it's not about them. They are not the light. They're supposed to be leading people to the light. Uh -huh. Walking around here with security details. Yeah. Don't get quiet on me now. <laughs> what kind of life have you lived that has you scared to go out on your own? If you ain't trusting in God, what kind of preacher are you? Uh, I, I, I just want to talk a little bit about this situation right now. Because it doesn't sit right with me. We're walking around with coattail riders. And people loving around your mess. You can't even turn the page of your own Bible. What kind of preacher are you? Don't get quiet on me now. I mean, really. Is that the example that John set? That's not the example that John set. John said that he must increase, but I must decrease. To me, that's a clear indication 
that John knew that it was not about him. Yeah. It was about Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm talking about the one whom God sent from above. Yeah. Now, as John the Baptist began his ministry with deference and humility, it was not so with John the Evangelist. Like many of us, like many of us, initially, John the Evangelist, he, he wanted all the glory and the honor of being associated with Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he was one of those coattail riders I just mentioned. mentioned. Uh, he thought he was going to ride in on the coattails of Jesus. Uh, but he didn't want the trial and tribulation of a Savior. That's right. But he wanted all the honor and glory of the Savior. Yeah. That sounds like many of us. Uh, yeah. We don't want to go through anything. That's right. But we want to be exalted. Yeah. When many of us first come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, yeah. we believe all our suffering days are over. Yeah. We forget that Christ said, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. We must be prepared yeah. for difficult days ahead. Yeah. We must not grow weary in our well-doing, regardless of the intensity of the persecution for righteousness' sake. To persevere on this Christian journey, we must keep in mind that it's not about us, but it's about who we know. John the Evangelist had to learn what it meant to truly serve beyond one's own self-motivation and beyond one's own self-interest. There is nothing inherently wrong with having ambition. But it must be balanced with proper perspective. You don't mistreat people just to get to the end of uh, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. You don't run roughshod over your brothers and sisters just to accomplish a goal. Just so you can look good in the eyes of others. If you've been called to a good work, do your good work with humility. It should be done with meekness and understanding that all things which are hands are put to use in doing, it should be done for the glory of God yeah. and not for the glory of self. Yeah. And watch this, not for the glory of your office yeah. and not for the glory of your organization. Yeah. Don't get quiet on me now. Yeah. Uh, not for the glory of your church and definitely not for the glory of your pastor. Yeah. I'm talking about everything that you, that, that you do should be for the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, this same John, this same John, yes, I'm talking about John this afternoon, and his brother James, they wanted a place of honor beside Jesus Christ in the kingdom. Ain't that what the scripture says? Uh, they wanted a place of honor, but they never inquired about service. Do you know what it means to serve? I was called to be a servant. I know they got reverend on the program, but I'm not a reverend. I'm a minister. I'm a servant of God. I was called to serve. I was called to minister to God's people. Uh, I want you to know something. I'm looking for the place that's low on the, on the, uh, the, the totem pole. I, I want to be at the feet of my brother. The word of God says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I don't know about you, but I don't care about being first down here on earth. I'll be last here on earth so I can be first in heaven. My brothers and sisters, as we look deeper into the Word of God, and I'm beginning to wrap this up so uh, we can go home and, and, and dive into our dinner this afternoon and all the other things that we got to do. But, but, but as we look deeper into this Word of God and, and we see John's maturity in, in Christ Jesus, uh, that's something that we should all be doing, is growing and maturing in the Word. And I'm here to tell you right now, Sunday morning ain't going to cut it. Uh, preaching ain't gonna cut it. You need to get some Bible study in you and some Sunday school in you and some, some, some revival in you and, and anytime the church doors are open in you, that's the only way that you're gonna grow and, and gain strength by working that muscle. I'm talking about the heart muscle. Yeah. By working that muscle and, and growing in God and maturing in your relationship with God. Uh, 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 am I preaching to somebody? Did somebody come to hear the word of God? Uh, I'm sorry that there's no bluff. I'm just trying to give you the meat of the word of God. Uh, when we read John's gospel and, and the epistles and, and then the revelation, uh, we see that John has, has matured and, 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 to, and he's beginning to gain a true understanding of what he was called to do. And, and more more importantly, who called him to do it? Uh, we must not lose sight of who has called us to do our good work. We should rejoice that just as there was opportunity for John to grow and to be renewed in his spirit, so my brethren can we. 
I'm thinking on Apostle Paul, uh, who says uh, uh, we must become a new creation in Christ. Uh, yeah. The old must pass away, yeah. and all things become spiritually new within yeah. us. Uh, sometimes we must uh, figuratively find ourselves exiled on our own Isle of Patmos uh, before we realize that it's not about us. Uh, uh, when we are isolated and removed from fanfare, uh, when, we're, we're, when we are removed from the, the, the limelight, and people calling our name and telling us how good we are. Then and only then can we hear the voice of God. Yeah. Some time ago, I want to share a short story with you. Uh, I was in a hospital uh, uh, some years ago uh, for 18 months. I spent 18 months in, in a single occupant hospital room. Mm -hmm. And I was recovering from it. I wasn't crazy. Somebody, somebody, somebody said, oh, was he in the crazy house? <laughs> I didn't say the room was packed. It was a hospital room. Yeah. I'd been in an accident. Yeah, don't go out here saying the preacher over in Providence, that boy was crazy. <laughs> I was in the hospital. Yeah. I was in an accident that nearly claimed my life. Yes. And um, I thank God that I can look back on it yeah. and, and you know laugh about it now. Yes. But it was no laughing matter at the time. Right? Yeah. But God is good. Yes. Um, but that room, in that room, for those 18 months, I was down in Georgia. My family was still at Fort Bragg, mm -hmm. so I was isolated. Mm -hmm. All of those that thought so highly of me were not there mm -hmm. to pat me on my back and tell me it was going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. It was just me and Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And that's where my life reached a turning point. Yeah. In that room, mm -hmm. although I had grown up in church mm -hmm. and had worshipped God all my life, mm -hmm. Come on. what I found was that I really didn't know Jesus. That's right. mm -hmm. That room became my owl of Patmos. I was exiled in that room for 18 months. And I began to hear the voice of God. And God told me that he was going to heal me from my affliction. But he said it wasn't going to be in me. He said you're going to have to go through something. He said you're going to learn patience. It's not going to be on your time. It's going to be on my time. And there were good days and there were bad days. Some days they would come in with a good report. And four or five day, days later, they would come in with a bad report. Wow. It takes a special measure of faith come on. to stay encouraged. That's like David right. says, sometimes you've got to encourage yourself. Yes. And I was down there in that, in that Isle of Patmos for 18 months. Yes. But I learned to encourage myself. I sought refuge in the word of God. And eventually I understood something that it was not about me. See, prior to that accident, I was puffed up. I thought I was all that. I had people telling me how, how, how good of a soldier I was. Yeah. I had all kinds of awards. I thought I was better than sliced bread. But God laid me low. And he made me suffer through something. And I thank God for it. Because it changed me. And it brought me into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ. And I learned what my purpose was. God's purpose will always prevail over evil. The evil that your enemy intends for you, yes. it will not triumph over God. Amen. Genesis 50 and 20 tells us, what is meant for evil, God will use it to our good. Amen. And as I begin to close here, we should aspire to be like these two St. John's, in the manner that their words and their ways point people to Christ. Amen. We say we seek more light. But are we seeking the true light? Yeah. Uh, if we are seeking a light that is other than Jesus, then what we seek is temporary as opposed to eternal. Yeah. I want a light that uh, when dark days of the world begin to impose, there is light in my heart. A light that won't go out. But when the doctor walks in your room with dark results in his hand, the light of Jesus will help you see your way through. Yeah. Help me as I close this thing out. Yeah. When your friends desert you in a time of need, somebody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Jesus is a light and a friend in your solitude. Yeah. He will stick closer to you than a brother. Yeah. And when you find yourself on an aisle of Patmos, yeah. seek the light that is Jesus. Yeah. It's not about you. It's about who you know. I thank God for my cross to bear. Because it reminds me that it's not about me. It's about who I know. If it's not about you this afternoon, but it's about who you know, you ought to praise God right now. Knowing that it's only through him that you made it through. If you made it through a trial and you know you didn't overcome.
overcome on your own. Yeah. If you made it through a trial yeah. and it wasn't by your own power. Yeah. If you made it through a trial yeah. and it wasn't by your own knowledge. Yeah. If you made it through a circumstance yeah. and it wasn't by your own strength. Yeah. If you made it through a tribulation yeah. and it wasn't by your prayers, yeah. then you know something. Yeah. You know like I know that it wasn't about you. It was about who you know. Yeah. I stand to tell you that no enemy can hold back my blessings because I know a true God. I know a living God. You can't frustrate my anointing. You can't redirect my destiny. You can't stand in the way of my blessing. God has already sent me to an assignment. It's already decreed. It's sealed in the book. It was sealed before I got here. It was sealed before I drew breath. God has already appointed me to an assignment. God has already anointed me. God has already anointed you. Speak that thing in truth. You need to claim that thing that you're waiting on. You need to walk out in faith and grab it. But remember something. As you're walking, and as you're grabbing, it's not about you. It's about who you know. May God bless you and have a smile upon you.